thankful for this word that we've been talking about for the past few weeks. Um, and, I, and I trust and pray that, that your prayer life is growing. Amen? I said I trust and pray. We're not just talking about prayer. Amen? I think if we're just talking about a, th- a, a prayer, then we're just kind of knowing it by theory. Amen? How many of you know that in the book of James it talks about being doers of the word? Amen? And not just hearers only. So I pray that as we're learning about prayer, we would practice prayer. Can somebody say amen tonight? That as we learn about it, we put it into practice. As you yield yourself to God and as you, you say, Lord, you know, I receive your word, then guess what? That word takes root in your heart. It is planted in your life so that you can act upon it. Amen. So anytime that the Lord gives us a word, it's important for us to, to begin to put it into practice. Amen. The Lord is so awesome, church. He's not just a God that's, that's a theory. He's not just a God that's like far away. He's not a concept. He's a person. Amen. And he's powerful. And so if you put his word to the test, if you, if you use it and you, you say, God, I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to take you for your word, Lord. Then the Lord will absolutely just, you know, act upon that. Because that is a move of faith. That is an action of faith. Amen. And so I want us to continue tonight. This is the the fourth part of this series. And for the next few moments, I want to speak to you about yearning for God. Yearning for God. Having a hunger and a desire and a thirst for the Lord. How many of you are, are hungry for the Lord? You're thirsty for God. Amen. And I pray that you are. Last week we spoke about asking of God and we learned a lot and we learned about many things. We learned about our motives in prayer. Amen. You know that your motive in prayer is very important. How you pray and the way that you pray and the way that you address God and and the place that your heart is in when you address God is extremely important. It's important because we can't just ask with, with our own motives. We cannot just ask with, you know, selfish thinking. We cannot just ask based on our own desires or will, but we must pray according to the will of God. Amen. We must know what the word of God says over our life, and we must pray according to that. And so we learned uh, about one of these things is we learned that the reward of those who pray and the reward of those who seek Jesus is himself. And did you know, church, that that's the best reward that you could ever receive in prayer? Amen? That when you pray, the Bible says that the reward is him. That's a pretty good reward. If I get Jesus when I pray, if I get God, if I get the Holy Spirit, the Godhead, the Trinity, if I get them summed up in one, that when I bow my knee to pray, that's a great exchange. I would think that people would be more apt to step into prayer because of who they're receiving when they pray. Amen? I would think that people would want to be in that prayer closet more more often than not because of who they receive in that moment as they pray. But the truth of the matter is this, is a lot of people don't pray. A lot of people just think that prayer is some kind of discipline or it's some kind of thing that you do. And, and, and listen, the Lord doesn't want us to look at it that way just as a, as a discipline, but he wants us to desire him. He wants us to want to spend time with him. How many of you have ever been with somebody that you kind of feel like they don't want to be around you? Has that ever happened to you? You're kind of sitting there and it's kind of awkward and, you know, you're, 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 you, you sit down with them and they're kind of like, you know, not making eye contact and they're sort of avoiding you and they, they don't really want to strike up conversation with you and it, and it becomes an awkward thing. And do you know that the God of heaven, he pursues us with his love? He chose us. He sought after you. He chose you before the foundations of the world. He formed you. So that you could know his son and transform into the likeness of his son to fulfill his purposes in the earth. God has a tremendous plan for your life, church. He has a tremendous plan for my life. He has so many things in store, but guess what? We have to desire him above all of it. Don't desire the ministry. Don't desire the positions. Don't desire the promotions. Don't desire the things that you want in life, but just desire him. We learn that if moving a mountain is your greatest focus or desire when you pray, then you're missing the point. 
A lot of people pray for things, and you know what? That's fine. God's given us permission to bring those things to him. Amen? But it should never be about the point of moving the mountain as much as it should be to focus on the mountain mover. Amen? And so we learn to change our prayer focus from our desires to delighting in the Lord. Amen? And so tonight I want us to learn a, a, a few more things about uh, what yearning is and why yearning is important. That word yearn in the, in the Hebrew, it actually means, it, 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 as used in the Bible, it means to grow excited. It means to grow hot and to burn. Say it one more time. That word yearning means to be excited. It means to grow hot. And it actually means to burn. And we're still talking about prayer, but I, I want us to just think about this tonight. Is your time in prayer a burden or a burning for the Savior of your soul? Is your time in prayer, is it like, oh man, got to wake up and do this? Is it a burden or is it a burning for the Savior of your soul? Is your time in prayer full of what you want from him or how desperately you need him? There's a big difference. Amen? One is about you and the other is about him. One is inwardly focused and the other one saying, God, I just want you. And I want us to look at different prayers and portions of Scripture throughout the Bible quickly tonight because I believe the Lord will show us what true yearning for him looks like. So let's open up to Psalms chapter 84, verse 1. The psalmist said this, he says, How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. He said, My soul yearns and even faints for the courts of the Lord. He says, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Let's read it one more time. Would you read it with me, church? Everyone say it. Go back to the verse one. Ready? How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Verse two. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. See, is that where your heart is? The psalmist was able to say it. He was, he was able to, to desire that. That was his prayer. That was his desire. But what is your desire? I want us to learn a couple things from these few verses. The psalmist characterizes the dwelling place of God. He characterizes heaven's throne room as a lovely place. It's not just any place, it's a lovely place. And knowing this simple truth, church, it changes everything when you pray. Because some people are fearful to pray and to ask God or to approach God because of their sin. Some people are afraid to pray and bend their knee in prayer and, and, and have conversation with God because of the things that they've done in their past and the things that they maybe are doing in the present. And so there's this shame thing that happens, and so people, they relegate, they, they back off, and they don't want to pray. They're afraid to pray. They're afraid to talk to God. But here, the Scripture tells us that the dwelling place of God, it's a lovely place. Doesn't that sound like a place you want to go? That sounds like a place I want to go. I want to go to a lovely place. I don't want to just go to any place. It doesn't say it's a place you should fear. It doesn't say it's a place you should worry about. It says it's a lovely place. And where God dwells, there is perfect love. Amen? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 15 says this, If anyone acknowledges Jesus is the Son of God, then God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and we rely on the love that God has for us, for God is what? Love. And whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. There's a lot of preachers and a lot of teachers and people that, that, that sometimes don't want to preach on the love of Jesus because they suppose that it depicts that God is someone that isn't righteous or ruling or powerful or a God of wrath and judgment. Nowadays, you know, when we hear that Jesus is, 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 is a loving Savior, people automatically want to take that down a road where they assume that because he's loving, that that means that he's tolerant and he's accepting. But how many of you know that the, 
that Jesus is no different from the Father and the Father is no different from the Spirit. They're all one. They're all one. And so they can embody love and truth in the same person. They can embody love and righteousness in the same person. But there's people that actually believe that if they preach on love, then the church will get soft. And it'll turn towards acceptance and tolerance rather than truth in love. But we cannot ignore the greatest element of God that I am speaking of at this moment. And that is his perfect love. How many of you know that God loves you? That is the most powerful truth that you will ever receive in your life. Knowing that the God of this universe, the God who formed you into being, doesn't have to love you, but chooses to love you. Amen. He doesn't have to care for us, but he chooses to care for us. He didn't have to send his son as the penalty for our sins, but yet it, the Bible says it pleased God to see his son be stricken. It was in the heart of God to win your soul. We cannot ignore that fact. And it's the loving kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 says, Do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance in his patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you into repentance? Titus chapter 3 and verse 4 says this, But when the kindness and the love of our God and our Savior appeared, he saved us. Everybody say, he saved me. Hopefully we're all saved tonight. If we're not, then we'll work on that. But I want us to understand this. He saved you. You had nothing to do with it. Was it because of how many times you've attended church or how many ministries that you've served in? Those are all nice things. He saved you. He saved you. And it says this. It says, not because of the righteous things that we had done. But because of his mercy, everybody say mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he has poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So church, unless we approach the dwelling place of God, unless we approach that place with his love in mind, then we'll never approach him. See, here's the thing that I need us to understand tonight. People do not pursue God because sometimes they think that God is, is against them and God is, is, is a God that is, you know, a, a fearful God. Now, we need to fear the Lord in reverence, but we don't have to be afraid of him. There is an invitation that prayer offers every single one of the, uh, us, and that is to step into the presence of God. It's a place where you can actually commune with the loving father of your soul. It's a place where you can speak to the one who desires to speak to you. It's a place where you can join and you can actually sit at a table in front of God and you can commune with him. This is the greatest treasure that you could ever have in this world, church. There is nothing greater than this than being able to approach the Lord. But unless you know that he loves you, you'll never approach him. People that are sin-focused, I want us to understand this, meaning they're aware of their sin or their mistakes or their past, they invite the condemning voice of the enemy to stop them before they actually speak to God. I meet people all the time that I have to, I have to like break that, that condemnation, that, that, that just voice, the lies of the enemy. I have to break it off of their life every time that I talk to them because they say, oh, pastor, well, I sinned. I, I fell away from God. And you know what? I'm glad that they acknowledge that they sinned or that they did something wrong. Thank God for conviction of the Holy Spirit. Amen. But here's the deal. You can't allow the enemy to turn conviction into condemnation. You can't allow him to turn conviction into condemnation because guess what? You will stay in that place where you do not speak to God. Pastor said it perfectly on Sunday when he was talking about Adam in the garden. And, and, and after Adam and Eve sinned, what did they do? They hid from God. It's so many people, they sin, they fail God, and all of a sudden they begin to hide themselves from God. When prayer is an invitation to speak to God. 
Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't be aware of sin in our life. But here's the deal. As long as it doesn't overshadow the Savior of your soul. You can be aware of the things that you've done wrong and, and, and you should be. But at the end of the day, we must be more aware of the one who longs to save us, who longs to transform us, who longs to purify us, who longs to share his heart with us than we are the things that we have done wrong. The psalmist said, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. We need to know that the Lord wants us to step into that place. Verse 2, he says, my soul yearns. My soul yearns and even faints for the courts of the Lord. He's so desperate. He's so desiring for the things of God. He says, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Not for a dead God, not for an unknown God, but for a God that he knows well. And it's because, church, of his awareness and affection and his delight wasn't on what he was, but rather on who he had access to. Do you hunger for God? Do you desire him? When you wake in the morning, is the first thing you think of the job that you have to perform that day or the places you have to go or actually spend time with the one who wants to spend time with you? You see, if our priorities are out of order, then we will always view God from our point of view and our opinion instead of for who he is. That word yearning means to burn. How many of you have ever burned passionately for something? Let's go back just for a few minutes and, and we'll go back to the holiday season. How many of you had something on your Christmas list that you really wanted? Raise your hand. It's okay. Be honest. Nobody raise your hand. Seriously. All right, my wife. Yeah, my wife's in the back. Like, yeah, I got, I got things on the list. <laughs> Okay, go back to when you were 10 years old. Maybe it was easier then, right? When you were 10, everybody wanted something. You had that list. I had lists. I had things that I wanted, you know, and whether it was like Legos or, you know, you guys don't even know what Legos are, Lincoln Logs or, you know, I had all these things that I used to like. So much so that, that I desired them that I would tell my parents, Dad, what do you think? You know, I think I can get this, Dad. And, you know, you, you know, you'd be desiring of that thing. You, you, you would just ask them about it constantly, and you would almost get to the point of begging them and, and desiring so much that they would do something for you so that that desire could be fulfilled. And God is actually wanting us to have that same type of thing, that thing where we burn passionately for something but instead of burning for something, we burn for someone, and that's him. Instead of burning for things that, that will rot in this world, that will fade away, that will never you know, amount to anything in your life, he wants us to desire and to burn for him. I ask you a question again. How many of you are hungry for the Lord? Amen. How many of you are desiring and longing to spend your time with him? Amen. Then this should be identified in your life of prayer. Prayer is probably the least attended ministry in our church. I'm just being honest with you. And there's reasons for that. A lot of times people use things like, well, I work. Well, I have this going on. I have that going on. But leave the service aside. And just say, do you pray at home? If we spend as much time in prayer as we do on social media, there'd be miracles happening all up and down this place every single day. 
If we spend as much time in prayer and desiring God, the devil would have no grip over your family and over your life. If we spend as much time communing with God in prayer, you would be walking on water. <laughs> and so it's easy for us to say that we yearn for God. But it's actually a lot more real and challenging to actually prove it to God. I could say I'm hungry for God every single day. Oh, God, I desire you. And you know what? That sounds really nice in a setting like this. But if I don't pray to the one and I don't spend time in that place with him, then do I really yearn for him? Or am I yearning for things that I want him to do for me? Or am I yearning for things that, that you know, I just want to look a certain way? I'll move on. King David, he had fled to the desert to escape Absalom, a man who was actually after the, the, the throne to rule over God's people. And David had escaped from this king, uh, from this man, and in the desert, David cried out to God in Psalm 63. In verse 1, he says this, he says, you, God, are my God. He says, and I earnestly, I seek you. He said, I thirst for you, and my whole being longs for you. He says, in a dry and parched land where there is no water. He said, I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Now, I want to make note of a few things here because there's some things that are important for us to understand and to get tonight. David is saying these words from a desert. How many of you have ever been in the desert? Anybody ever been in the desert? Yeah, it's pretty hot out there, isn't it? It's pretty miserable. It's pretty desolate. There, there, deserts don't offer us much. Deserts aren't a place of comfort. Deserts are a place of like torture and torment, right? If you were like to, you know, live at any place in the world, you probably wouldn't choose a desert. You'd probably choose the place next to the river or the place next to a lake or the place next to a mountain. A desert is not a desirable place to be. And I want us to understand something because David is in the middle of a desert and he's saying, earnestly, I seek you. Earnestly, I thirst for you. He's not looking for a well to get water from. He's looking to the wellspring of life. The Savior. There's a huge difference. Because David isn't concerned with his natural and his present need of actually dying of thirst in a desert. He's saying, if I can attain the one who will satisfy my soul, then guess what? I'll be fine. That's what yearning looks like. Yearning looks like saying, I want more the solution of who Jesus is instead of the thing that I need in the natural Instead of the present need that I might have before me. He could have prayed all kinds of things. He could have said, Lord, destroy Absalom. Lord, do all these different things. God, you know, just, you know, get my enemies away from me. God, you know what? I would love some water out here. It's hot. He could have prayed for a million different things. But he said, Lord, I am looking to you. There's a lot of people, church, that are in desert seasons of their life. And they often look for refreshing in their own resources. There's people that say, you know, they're going through a season in their life and they're going through a hard time and they look for refreshing in their own resources. And they look for refreshing in their own supply or their own desires instead of trusting the one who said in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd and I lack nothing. When you have him, you lack nothing. I'll say it one more time. When you have him, you lack nothing. Nothing. It's not Jesus and. It's Jesus. And he becomes the supply of everything that you need. He says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And he leads me beside quiet waters. And he refreshes my soul. And he guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Church, what do shepherds do? They lead the flock. Right? Right? 
That's what a shepherd does. A shepherd leads the flock. And so if God leads you into a desert, then God will be your drink. If God takes you out into this place where you have to go for a season of your life, then guess what? God himself will provide everything that you need. God himself is not going to be like, you know what? I wish you guys brought water. <laughs> Imagine if God was like, you know, go out into the desert, everybody. But when you get out there, you're like, okay, Lord, I'm here. You led me here. And then he's like, did y'all bring water? You're like, Lord, you didn't tell us to bring water. If he leads you into a desert, he doesn't expect you to dig your own well. Isaiah 58 and verse 11, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. And you will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Man, that sounds good, amen? That sounds refreshing. That sounds like satisfying. That sounds like the best thing that you could ever attain. And this is why David could say in a desert that his thirst was for God himself, that his whole being longed for God because he knew that the desert didn't determine his desire for God. He knew that his desert didn't determine his desire for God. No matter what he went through, he knew where his strength was. No matter what he faced, he knew in whom he trusted. And how many of us are, 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 know the Lord that way? No matter what you go through, you go through all kinds of sickness or trial or you go through you know, seasons where you know, you're ridiculed or you're accused of something. And in those seasons, you know in the one of whom you trust. You see, I know God that way. I've met that God. I've met the God that has carried me through seasons of all kinds of things. Ups and downs and prayers and, and spiritual warfare and battles in my life and all kinds of things. And God has brought me out and he's delivered me time and time again. So the next time that I go into a desert, I don't go unequipped because I say, Lord, I know that you brought me here. I know that I'm here and I know that you're present with me. I know that you are guiding me. I know that you're leading me. A lot of people go through spiritual seasons, and some seasons, church, are full of light. Some seasons that you go through are just happy and awesome and joyful and, and just blissful, but others are dark. Others are challenging. Some are rainy, and other seasons are dry. But the lesson here is that God isn't subject to your season. God isn't subject to the things that we go through as if all of a sudden, he's not God. You know that God doesn't worry about the things that you worry about? That's why he said that when he would transfer his yoke upon you, that it would be light and easy. Because all those things that we carry in our heart and we carry in our life, all those burdens that sometimes weigh us down, that cause us to not bend our knee in prayer. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. I will give you rest for your souls. This should be the reason, church, that we long for him. Amen? This should be the reason that you desire him all the more, because like David, we too remember the faithfulness of God. How many of you know that God has been faithful to you? Amen? Amen. David said this, I've seen you in the sanctuary, and I have beheld your power, and I've beheld your glory. You see, David stepped into the presence of God through that veil of prayer to behold God's power and glory. It was said this way, a coal is revived by wind, and so prayer revives the hopes of the heart. You see, when that flame is beginning to burn out, a little bit of wind will cause it to burn again. And if your soul is, is, is malnourished, it's weak, it's tired, it's weary, spending time in prayer, church, it's going to cause you to hope in the one that is, is, is to be hoped in. It's going to cause you to invigorate your life. It's going to cause a spark to happen in your life once again where, guess what, all of a sudden you desire him all the more. And it trains us and it teaches us to know, that church, that when you feast on him, 
John chapter 6, Jesus talks about how his, his blood would be our drink and that his body would be our food. And that we would feast upon what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And that our work and the will of God and fulfilling the will of God was his supply. When we understand this and we step into a place of prayer, church, all of a sudden it changes the dynamic completely. It changes the way you operate in prayer because guess what? You go into that place desiring him and only him. Can I tell you something, church? Never be too lazy to pray. I'll say it one more time. Never be too lazy to pray. Charles Spurgeon said this, not to pray because you do not feel fit to pray is like saying I won't take medicine because I'm too ill. I'll say it again. Not to pray because you do not feel fit to pray is like saying I will not take medicine because I am too ill. You see, true prayer to the Lord should be less about discipline and more about our desperate desire for God and for his ways. Amen. I pray, church, and I, I long for the day that we would include a yearning in our prayer for him. That when we pray, church, we would desire him in his ways. Psalms 119, he says this, verse 20, he says, My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. Consumed means like it's, there's no room for anything else. Amen? There's no place for anything else because he's completely consumed. He said, my soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. You, ch you know, church, I find it nearly impossible for a world to truly yearn for God but not care for his ways. I find it nearly impossible for a people of God to, to just, you know, say, you know what? You know, I yearn for God but I don't yearn for his ways. I yearn for God, but I don't yearn for his word. I find that impossible. I yearn for God, but I don't yearn for his covenants and for his righteousness. You cannot just long for what God has and not for who God is. But we must desire him for himself. Do you long for the righteousness of God as much as you long for God himself? Hmm. You see, this has to be the directive. This has to be the desire of our heart as well. That we long for the righteousness of God as much as we long for his love. Do you long for the rebuke of God as much as you long for his presence? You see, sometimes when we worship God, we just say, oh, this is so nice. And, you know, the songs are so lovely and this is amazing. But actually what's happening is when you step into the presence of God, the Lord is transforming you his presence is 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 disciplining us if we need discipline it's correcting us if we need correction it's rebuking us if we need rebuking it's it's sanctifying us if we need to be sanctified Isaiah 26 and verse 9 he says this my soul yearns for you in the night and in the morning, my spirit longs for you. He says, when your judgments come upon the earth, the people of the world learn righteousness. You see, our yearning for his presence must include a yearning for righteousness. Amen. His, everybody, I just want you to say amen. amen. <laughs> our yearning for his presence must include a yearning for his righteousness because a lot of people just seek God for comfort a lot of people just seek God for love a lot of people just seek God for joy and you know what these are great things but quickly forget that when you abide in his presence you'll pick up his heart when you abide in the presence of God you'll pick up his eyes when you abide in the presence of God you'll pick up his ways when you abide in the presence of God, you'll pick up his kingdom, his burdens, his plans, his purposes for your life. This is what prayer is supposed to yield in your life. A yearning for all of him. I heard it said this way, a king, a 
kingdom without a king is just dumb. <laughs> a kingdom without a king is just dumb. And we throw out around the word that, oh, he's Lord of my life. Is he? If he's Lord of your life, then he has access and control and dominion over your life. That when he says, you do. When he says go, you leave. When he says jump, you say how high. That's what him being Lord looks like. And the Lord is actually looking and longing for his people to once again be sensitive enough to his voice that when he speaks, we obey. Matthew 6 and 33, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. A lot of times we just pass over the righteousness part and we get to the part that says, and all these things will be given to you. But we can't overlook the righteousness part because without it, we're unacceptable to God. Without being clothed in the righteousness that Jesus has provided for us, then we are unacceptable to God. We must be clothed in the righteousness of his son, Jesus. Amen. And as you pray, I hope that you come to realize that he is all that you need. That he is everything that we need. Psalm 73, verse 25. Every time I read this verse, it just ministers to my heart. He says, whom have I in heaven but you? When I read that verse, church, it, 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 it breaks my heart in such a special way. Because if the end goal and the desire and the ultimate fulfillment of our life is to gain heaven, to one day cross that threshold into the courts of God, that we have to know that heaven contains the person and the only one who makes that possible, and his name is Jesus. Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Can we pray like they prayed? Is that your prayer tonight? Is that your desire that the earth has nothing that you desire? Nothing that you desire besides God. That when you open your lips and you open your voice to speak to God, is he all that you desire to speak to. Whom have I in heaven but you, Lord? If heaven does not contain Jesus, then I don't want to go. But if that is the place where God has divinely chosen for him to rule and to reign, church, then that's the place that I long to be. And I'll say this as I close tonight. It's important for us that when we pray and we close our eyes and we, and we begin to just lift our voices to God, that we pray with such desire for him that his desires become ours, that his heart becomes ours.